mark in a little bit of time. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, welcome. My name is Mark Scott, I'm Politico's Chief Tech Correspondent, and thank you for joining us today uh, for a debrief of the recent EU-US Trade and Tech Council meeting in Paris. Uh, we're very, very uh, good. it's great to have some people, frankly, who are in the room uh, in Paris this weekend. So we, first of all, we have Turin Chadra, from, uh, who is the Senior Director for Technology and National Security from the White House National Security Council. Alejandro Kaisnos from a uh, member of the cabinet of Margaret Vestiga from the European Commission, and Alina Polyakova, the president of SIPA, who's here to give us uh, her analysis. Um, as much as I like to hear myself uh, speak, uh, it would be great to get some uh, interaction into this conversation. Uh, you can set, submit your questions for those who already have not on the on SIPA.org. Uh, please go to the website, check it out, fill in the, the description and your, your question. All I would ask is that you give where you're from. I'm not taking any anonymous questions. So that, so with all those logisticals out of the way, uh, thank you all for, for joining us this morning, this afternoon. Um, we've had the second round of the uh, Trade and Tech Council meeting uh, in Paris this weekend. Um, I did a quick control F on the final statement that came out on, on Monday. I'm seeing 56 uh, references to Russia, uh, including in the second graph. Um, it's very difficult not to talk about transatlantic relations at the moment without talking about the war in, in Ukraine. Um, as I'm based in, in, in London, Alejandro, I'm going to defer to the European time zone to kick this off. How much has uh, Russia's invasion in February sort of affected the discussions both within the principles of the TTC as well as the working group uh, meetings and discussions? Um, thank you very much, um, Mark, and thank you to SEPA for organizing this and, and, and for inviting me. It's, it's nice to see you all and nice to see the room so, so soon after, after Paris. Um, coming to your question, I, uh, obviously the TTC was launched um, at the summit last year. We had our first meeting in Pittsburgh uh, back in September of 21. So we already had an agenda that, that was running, a fairly ambitious agenda. But uh, it goes without saying that uh, Russia's uh, war of aggression against Ukraine uh, certainly focused our minds both at the political level, but then that translated, I would say, extremely quickly into, into um, some of the work that the, the, the working groups were able to do. And, um, and that means that uh, thanks to the fact that we had the TTC, that we already had uh, uh, a common framework, a, a, a forum, uh, we could do some things very quickly. Uh, and there, I think the, the example of expert controls uh, comes to mind as, as, the, as the clearer one. I think Tarun did the harder work than me on that one, so I, I, I shouldn't be taking the credit. But it's, it's clear that um, had we not had the TTC uh, before this happened, we would have had to invent it. Uh, and the fact that we had it allowed us to, to coordinate uh, uh, extremely quickly, um, align policies, and then uh, get, get others on board. Uh, and uh, export control is the prime example, but there are other areas where we, I think, quickly adapted uh, to the situation, uh, whether it's on cyber, whether it's on uh, disinformation, uh, um, uh, so that uh, we could deliver results. So I, I would say that... Um, uh, if you look at what came out of Seclay, uh, some of it was a predetermined agenda where we uh, delivered on, on what was already planned. Um, some of it was specific uh, about Russia and uh, 57 is uh, in 50 pages is, is, is indeed quite a lot. 
Um, but I would say that the war has also accelerated the wider agenda beyond the Russia uh, measures itself, because I think we are now obviously taking some of the lessons learned from this crisis uh, and, and looking at the future and how we can how we can adapt to be better prepared for such situations. Tarun, this is when I'm going to give you an opportunity to take all the credit for the export controls. But how, how much from, from DC's perspective has TC, TTC helped sort of frame the global discussion on the pushback against Russia? Thanks, Mark. And you know, let me echo um, Alejandro's thanks to you and to Alina for hosting us today. It's great to be with my friend Alejandro here. Uh, we were uh, working together from certainly from the earliest days of uh, the Biden administration to try to not just to um, uh, get the work going, but actually to launch the TTC in the first place. So um, we were partners in crime early on uh, in this project. So um, look, I agree with everything that Alejandro just said about um, the TTC being a platform. You probably saw that President von der Leyen, President Biden, you know, issued a statement um, when we when we when we um, uh, had the TTC earlier this week and called the TTC a pillar of transatlantic uh, cooperation, and and that had just under a year of being established. Um, and that's just really true in a very practical sense. You know, to Andrew's point, you know, I uh, had a chance to participate in a lot of the very regular, almost daily discussions with commission counterparts in the run-up um, uh, to the uh, uh, Russia's uh, aggression in Ukraine. And um, that kind of coordination, uh, the kind of trust that we had built um, uh, connecting the right parts of the commission and the U.S. government over time really is a testament to um, what the what the TCC was able to establish over time. If you had asked us, you know, do you think we would have been able to build together an export control regime um, of the scope and ambition that we ultimately were able to agree on, um, uh, uh, you know, a year ago, I think uh, folks might have laughed, <laughs> laughed at us, right? Um, and so, obviously, um, it, it, it's, it's, it speaks to uh, our unity in the face of this uh, crisis, but it also I think, speaks to the fact that there was a lot of institutional uh, cooperation that was going on under the surface uh, to enable that degree of, of cooperation. And, and as Alejandro says, you know, I think now. Um, we see kind of what this toolkit really that we've been working on together through the TTC can accomplish. And I think, um, uh, you know, what, what a lot of discussion in Paris, I think, turned on really is how do we turn uh, what I think began as the agenda setting project um, uh, uh, as we've launched this, um, the, the policy development that you've now seen in this uh, joint statement um, kind of moving into you know projects that can that that, that now uh, hopefully you'll see uh, more of uh, when we meet uh, next later this year. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting into uh, what are we looking forward to at the end of the year but Alina without looking to, to throw sh shade on either Tarun and what Alejandro said how much does this matter right Th there's obviously ongoing work to push back against Russia from all Western countries how, how much do we need another um, transatlantic meeting to, to, to do this? Like, how important do you think it, it, it is to, to show a united front against Moscow? Well, th thanks so much for that question, Mark. Um, you know, while we were chatting here, I looked up how many times China was actually mentioned in the final statement, uh, which I hadn't done before. And it's only three times compared to the 56 times that Russia is mentioned. So um, that's actually quite surprising to me because, of course, it's, uh, ostensibly one of the reasons why the transatlantic community wanted to uh, invest in transatlantic cooperation technology is to set the rules of the road and the norms um, around technology use in all kinds of different ways um, to not allow authoritarian states that are leading in technology, being China primarily here, um, to set those rules of the road for us. Of course, Russia um, has not been a leader in technology by any uh, means of means of that uh, statement, but it's interesting to see how the balance has shifted because of Russian aggression against Ukraine. And to go to, directly to your question, I mean, of course, I think it is deeply, deeply important that the transatlantic alliance doesn't just present a united front on defense and security issues, which we have, um, or even just our democratic values and principles, but also on technology. Because at the end of the day, uh, regardless of the fact that Russia has launched a brutal you know, kinetic war in Ukraine, one that we never thought we would see, 
um, in this century, certainly, um, technology is, playing, is, is going to play an increasingly a key role in not just platform regulation, content controls, how we use artificial intelligence, et cetera, but also the future of war, right? And I think for, for many of those reasons, um, you know, in a way, I think you even said this earlier, um, the TTC was kind of taken over by the most urgent events on the ground, but I think if it hadn't been, it would have felt very irrelevant, um, given that this is the main concern for the Alliance right now. Um, this is the main concern, certainly for European security. Um, I think what I would have really been keen to see is actually a much deeper discussion of digital security issue issues and how that actually connects to what we're seeing um, in Russia's uh, kinetic war in Ukraine. So I think we're 10 minutes in and China's already been mentioned. I, I was hopefully saving that for the second half, but I suppose I, I, I got to ask now, Alina, because you brought it up. I mean, Alejandro, it does feel from, from where I sit that Washington is maybe more willing to go harder against China than the Brussels and the member countries are. As, as again, I'm going to put you on the spot as the representative for, for the, the commission. Why do you think China is only mentioned uh, to Alina's point three times in the final statement? That doesn't seem like uh, that many times, in, in, particularly when you look at the role that China is going to be playing in 5G, AI, and even platform governance as we go forward? Well, I think that there are several aspects to this. First of all, in terms of um, what the TTC is about, um, I think my boss always uses the, 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 the phrase, um, a good marriage is, is made because two people like each other, not because you don't like the third guy. Uh, and um, I think it's a good way to describe it. Um, at the end of the day, if you look at the substance, we're talking about exactly the same things. The point is, if we are able as EU and, and US to converge on the way we approach technology and to, on the way we approach <clears throat> the promote, the protect, the regulate side of technology. So in terms of, of boosting innovation, in terms of ensuring that there is appropriate governance, ensuring that there's appropriate safeguards, uh, we would be creating a model that in itself will um, promote a, our democratic values. Uh, it, will, it will help us um, lead the way, technologically speaking, it will help us lead the way in terms of uh, global standards. Um, and, and, and it goes without saying that those who are interested in promoting an autocratic vision of digital governance would not like that. So I think rather than control F, <laughs> this is, uh, you need a more nuanced reading of the statement to get an answer to that question. I mean, that's fair. And, you know, I'm, uh, as a journalist, I'm always accused of being quite, quite binary. So uh, I'll take that criticism. Um, Tarun, to, to, your, uh, to you on the China question, although China isn't specifically mentioned, you've got EU, US cooperation on international standards. You look at some of the 5G and ICT funding for third countries, for sort of trusted vendors, which from my perspective is sort of non-Chinese players, that there are elements in there that do seem to be have a Chinese focus. Am I reading the, through the runes correctly on that front? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I confess as a, as a former think tanker to uh, having used the control F function and then used it against policymakers in my own day. But I, I, I would, I would uh, proffer some limitations to the approach. I mean, look, look at the number of references to non-market economies. Look at the number of references, Mark, as you point out, to trusted and secure uh, ICTS. When you think about uh, what it is that we're focused on, on standards, um, why are we so focused on uh, trying to kind of preserve the integrity of technology standards bodies? Um, when you... Uh, look at the work on uh, trade, when you look at what we have to say about artificial intelligence and concerns about uh, social credit, for example, I, I, think, I think we all know that in, in many ways there is deep concern about China's conduct, right? So I don't think there's any, should be any secret there as to, as to how it's being assessed. Obviously, um, uh, in, in, uh, we will have slightly different ways of approaching some uh, the ways that we talk about this in certain Aura, but if you look at kind of what are the driving concerns, how are we aligning uh, in using relevant tools, um, you know, just compare where we are today with where the United States and the European Union or the Commission was uh, just a few years ago. 
um, or for that matter, compare where we were, you know, even during the Obama administration, um, uh, the, the degree of alignment, I think, is, is, is really uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, so in that respect, I, I think um, uh, I think most most folks who kind of look through this kind of understand uh, where our priorities are, where our shared concerns are as well. Um, but that doesn't mean necessarily, obviously, that we have to describe this uh, in entirely the same way or that we align on 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 every approach. I think I think the question is, um, uh, you know, we, we want a flexible forum so that we are in constant dialogue uh, about all of these challenges and the ways that we are approaching them. Um, you know, it, there, there's obviously the, the the formal ministerial that happens. There are the working groups that happen, but there's also you know the really critical informal exchange when uh, we are able to give uh, each other a heads up about really critical policy initiatives, consult with each other on them as well, and that's really baked into the fabric of the TTC as well. Alina, as someone who wasn't in those working groups, I'm going to ask you to, just to comment, right? Because it feels to me, from my discussions with those who were in those those meetings, that personal element matters. You know, if if the if, if the US is pushing something on cyber, the ability to WhatsApp, I know Alejandro to to Arun to give a city example, is quite useful. Like, how much do you think that that personal connection and ties can some, get over some of the ongoing issues that the US and, and Europe do have, both on trade and digital? No, I think I think that's huge. I mean, to my mind, um, you know, regardless of the specific deliverables that we will see through the TTC process, um, one of the key things that's already accomplished is establishing the direct lines of communication that we frankly didn't have before on these particular issues. Um, and that is helping the negotiations and conversations around issues that are not part of the TTC, you know, privacy shield, I think, being the, the most prominent one. Um, I think some there's also, um, I think it's also important to know that this is all happening within not just the context of the Russian war uh, against Ukraine, but also in the context of many other broader conversations that Brussels has been driving in terms of regulation. Of course, the Digital Services Act, which is now um, you know, law and it will be implemented, um, the Digital Markets Act. There's so many things on the agenda uh, within the EU, like the, the Data Act, the AI <laughs> Act, all of these different things where I think it would be valuable to start to think about how the TTC can also add value um, in ensuring a, alignment on these other somewhat separate, but obviously interconnected regulatory efforts. And of course, in the US, uh, we, are, we have a very different regulatory uh, environment, I'll just put it that way, <laughs> diplomatically, uh, where you know we're not actually aligned on some of the things that Brussels is doing uh, when it comes to uh, e-commerce and things of that nature. So, there are still things to work out. There are very clear tensions, um, especially when it comes to how I think Europe is looking at competition, the competition space more broadly. And because the American companies tend to dominate the space in such a significant way, it brings up all kinds of you know uh, potential challenges going forward. But I think the bottom line to me is that we need to have these relationships where people can talk these things out so that we're not just like escalating um, in uh, disapprovals or tensions or challenges and these conversations can actually happen more in the private space or behind you know, how diplomacy usually happens rather than being out in the open, uh, which we have had in the past as well on these issues. Yeah, I do remember um, former President Obama sending an open letter when uh, the European Parliament wanted to break up Google, which I'm not sure is the, the best way to, to mitigate those issues. Um, we'll, we'll get to the tension. Frankly, there is a lot of tension. But I don't want to belay the point that there have been some successes from the TTC. I mean, I, I reread the 48 page document this morning because, frankly, that's that's who I am. And you've got everything from a, a subgroup on AI and trustworthy AI. You look at the standards work. You look at export controls, investment screening, even down to data governance and sort of this um, crisis management system in terms of Russian disinformation. I mean, there's a lot, right? Particularly in terms of where it's come since the meeting in September for, in Pittsburgh. Alejandro, again, was just going to keep doing the cycle, so I'll come to you next. There's a lot in there. If you had to pick out sort of the your your favorite child or two, what would be the the the, the biggest success? Do you think from from this weekend's meeting? Um. I'll maybe try to choose a few that, that um, didn't make the, the headlines so much, uh, so we can also <laughs> uh, give them a, a little bit more time. Um, 
I think that the strategic standardization initiative that we launched uh, has a huge potential. Uh, so basically, uh, it's a mixture between a, a war room and a spreadsheet. So uh, where people are really going to be looking at what's happening throughout all these different committees in international standard setting bodies. Um, and we're going to, both from a defensive and offensive perspective, look where, where things uh, uh, are troublesome that are coming up so we can give ourselves early warning, so we'll be better prepared to react. Uh, we can be on our side coordinated with our member states, with our industry. Um, and also offensively look where there are proactive interests that, that there's room for collaboration. Um, and, and looking at how at the issues we've had in the past in some of these bodies and, and how some of them have, have been uh, flooded in order to tilt uh, standards in, in directions that we wouldn't like, uh, I think this, this has uh, a lot of potential to, to change things in, in very concrete ways. Um, um, we're very happy with the outcome on semiconductors. Um, we're going to set up a, a, an early warning pilot um, to address shortages uh, um, in, the, in the supply chain. Uh, we think this will help improve transparency and, and help us, if, if something happens, cooperate and, and avoid uh, uh, some of the, I think, worst situations we've, we've seen in the past uh, so we can have a common response. Uh, so, and, and we're also happy with what we've uh, agreed in terms of uh, avoiding a subsidy raise uh, with some principles and information exchange on, on how we're going to deal with, with um, uh, um, semiconductor in, uh, incentives. Um, and I think also the task force on uh, development finance. Uh, so we're, we're setting up a, a task force that will now, uh, very quickly, start um, trying to identify common projects. Uh, we've already agreed the principles that will guide this work uh, in third countries so that we can um, join forces in order to get, get a bigger impact uh, in terms of the, the lowering costs, bringing in investments, and tie that, of course, with, with the governance uh, that goes with it. So, secure infrastructure coupled with uh, uh, open democratic governance. I, I think that the, the the, um, the potential of doing things like this together, as opposed to each on our own, um, cannot be underestimated. I have th three follow-ups to you, Alejandro, before I ask the same question to, to, to Tarun. On the first one, can you give us a specific of what standards you're looking to cooperate with with the, the, with the US? On the subsidy front, I read the specifics in terms of sort of how both sides are going to be sharing information in terms of you know how they are going to be helping to fund domestic semiconductor manufacturing but are you not concerned that you know the intels of this world will just play each other off you know looking for the best uh, you know investment subsidy and and third on the telecom financing do you have a specific figure in mind i only ask because you know the chinese state banks have unlimited money frankly so how does even the big war chest of the European Union and the US competes, particularly when it comes to funding alternatives to, to Huawei. So on the on the standardization, where I think the easiest is to be past examples. So we've had some, I think, uh, worrisome attempts, uh, especially within the ITU, uh, to change the internet protocol. Uh, in a way that would be much more centralized and governable by states rather than you know, open and interoperable. Um, and that, uh, to be frank, we woke up really late into this game. So that is an example of something that we would be able to, to act much faster. And we've seen some initiatives around facial recognition that would uh, probably fall in this category. Um, and I think we would be uh, looking also for, for more proactive things and uh, beyond what we do in international organizations, we've also uh, agreed to look into uh, specific areas when it comes to our um, uh, respective uh, standard setting processes in the EU and the US uh, in order to, to seek interoperable standards. Um, and there, I think, uh, 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 charging the stations for electric vehicle calls took a lot of interest. Uh, we're also looking into uh, additive manufacturing and Internet of Things, among others. Um, as regards your um, second question, I think that, um, first of all, on the EU side, we have done state aid control for, for a long time. So this is this is not new for us. Um, and, and I think um, 
we will be applying these principles uh, in the way we implement the CHIPS Act. Um, and the truth is we have a, a common objective here to make our supply chains more resilient more resilient uh, and to find a, a balanced transatlantic approach to doing that. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we, even if these are substantial amounts, there's still limited envelopes right on both sides of the Atlantic. So uh, you're going to get much more value for money um, if uh, you can make sure that the subsidies that you give for specific projects are appropriate, are proportionate and necessary. Um, and I, that's what we've agreed uh, in, the, in the statement, and I'll let Tarun <laughs> explain how that works in the U.S., but the, the, we, we do have a common interest here, uh, uh, and that, and precisely to avoid the kind of subsidy shopping that uh, you've uh, described, which would de facto simply make taxpayers more than they would have otherwise uh, paid for the same result. Um, that's, that's why we've set this up. Uh, and finally, on the, on the money, I think uh, here we will go on a very targeted way. We will look at priority countries where we think we can we can make a difference. Um, and I think in terms of I cannot give you a figure, but in terms of the funding volume, you should not underestimate that if you count not just uh, uh, all the U.S. tools and all the EU level tools, including European Investment Bank, but also our member states tools. And frankly. In, in an ambitious way, we think about the international financial institutions where we both sit. Um, I don't think we we lack resources. What we like is a strategic. Where we, what we lack is a strategic use of them. Uh, and I think we hope through this task force, and uh, we can we can make concrete progress. Now, Taryn, I'm going to repeat myself, so forgive me, and, and hopefully your answers are not going to be the same as Alejandro's, but, you know, of the, frankly, large amount of output that came from this weekend, again, do you have a specific sort of victory or success that you think really does stand out as emblematic of what the TTC can do? Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, um, like a good bureaucrat, I love all my bullet points equally um, uh, in my fact sheets, but, <laughs> but I... Um, uh, in part because, look, our, um, the portfolio that uh, Alejandro covers is in so many ways similar to mine. I actually probably would have generated a similar list. Um, uh, you know, I think on uh, the semiconductor piece is, is particularly salient for us here because we are working as hard as we can uh, with the Congress to try to um, uh, uh, get the Bipartisan Innovation Act and the CHIPS bill uh, past the finish line. President Biden's been very vocal about that. Uh, he's talking about it um, traveling around the country. We'll continue to talk about it on his trip to Asia uh, when he departs later today. Um, uh, and, you know, the key issue there for us, as I think it is for our colleagues in Europe, is we need to make every taxpayer cent go as far as possible. And the way we're going to do that is by maximizing the amount of private capital that the incentives can draw. A and B, ensuring um, that there isn't a uh, instead of shopping and that we're as transparent as we can uh, and have generally aligned principles about these incentives. Uh, we all have an interest, a collective interest in maximizing semiconductor production in uh, allied and like-minded countries um, uh, where we have fewer concerns about supply chain vulnerabilities. And that's why uh, we are pressing so hard for the CHIPS Act, but we're very excited and encouraging um, uh, of what uh, Alejandro's colleagues are doing with the EU Chips Act, so we're excited that you know Intel's made some announcements uh, uh, about uh, um, setting up a fab in Germany. Um, uh, it's why you know we're also I think hopefully in the future we'll say a little bit more about what we could do together on R and D uh, when, uh, in the semiconductor area as well, so that we extend our um, technological leadership um, uh, thinking about. Uh, uh, the next generation uh, of semiconductors as well. Uh, I think the point uh, Alejandro made on um, digital infrastructure is really crucial. I think, uh, you know, we, uh, if we bring to bear um, the financing and, and again, really uh, some sort of strategic alignment to priorities on digital infrastructure, I think that could be very powerful. I think we're really at an inflection point where um, for a long time we've been focused on telecom and 5G, but now we have to think more broadly about digital infrastructure, um, uh, whether we're talking about cables, whether we're talking about cloud, because the next generation telecom, of course, will ride on the cloud. 
uh, uh, and data services writ large. And so I think our ability to um, work together there with European vendors, American vendors, European financing, American financing, and potentially also to join forces with other allies and other sources of like-minded funding as well um, uh, could really be quite powerful. So that's something that I'm, I'm very excited about uh, and hoping that we'll be able to um, share more about soon. Just on, on the standard side, you know, one highlight I think is our um, uh, agreement to develop this roadmap when it comes to evaluating risk, AI risks, um, that has a lot to do. You mentioned, Mark, you know, um, and Alina, I think um, um, uh, the, the work in Europe on an AI Act, I think here as well, um, we are focused on ensuring that the development of AI is trustworthy um, and conforms to our values uh, and supports them. Um, so I think that's an area where we have an opportunity to align on standards, even foster some technological development that's supportive um, and in the and hopefully kind of avert um, you know outcomes where we where we develop kind of parallel systems that aren't necessarily aligned. This is really an effort to try to do to engage early on uh, and, and develop alignment. Alina, I'm not going to ask you to sort of comment on what we just heard, but it, it feels to me that there is a lot of overlap here, right? I mean, it, it you know, no one wants to spend more money subsidizing semiconductors for Intel or other, you know, other tel chip makers as possible. Um, do, do, I mean, how do you see this working out? I mean, the, the, there's one thing creating a framework, there's another thing getting it to, to work in practice. Right. I mean, that's um where the trick is i guess you know devil's in the details when it comes to these things but i will say that i think uh, based on you know everything alejandro and tarun just shared and that i am convinced the ttc is really a bright spot when it comes to transatlantic cooperation and tech because on so many other issues um you know we were not actually well aligned frankly um you know because we are developing different regulatory uh, standards in some ways we're de developing different regulatory demands both incentives and I uh, say disincentives for different kinds of companies, tech companies, American companies, European companies. I mean, I think the GTC is primarily a bright spot because it actually brings us much needed security lens into the conversation. It could be even deeper in my view, given everything that's happening in the world, but certainly it's, it's an absolutely needed part of this larger structure that we're seeing developing on all kinds of conversations around technology. Uh, but you know, one of the concerns I've had is when we talk about things like interoperability, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to get to a place where, um, you know, when it comes to things like cloud, right? Cloud is going to be and is already critically important for even NATO capabilities, right? The ability to share data across the alliance, across NATO member states. Um, this has been coming up uh, very frequently since the war began in Ukraine, but it's already been an issue. Uh, so how do we start thinking about um, ensuring that we don't just have interoperability in the hard security space, but also in the digital space. And, you know, I have some concerns about our ability to actually do that. We can say we want to do that, uh, but my concerns are really about this uh, idea that you hear quite often in Europe of digital sovereignty, right? And it's not really clear what that fully means, to be frank. I think different uh, people I talk to have different understandings of the concept, uh, but certainly we don't want to end up in a place where we have you know, a French-led cloud or a German-led cloud or whatever, and they're not fully interoperable with each other. Um, and it makes actually data sharing very difficult uh, when, it, when it comes to national security reasons to share data, which are not becoming so, so prominent um, in, the, in the war effort, of course. So I think these are some of the tensions that I see where the TTC is kind of trying to coalesce around, but it's also purposely leaving uh, some of these issues outside the scope but it's not clear how and where and when we're going to be able to deal with them going forward. And I think the war in Ukraine has accelerated the need. You know, I was happy to see, for example, TTC does mention disinformation issues, uh, but there's no way forward there. This is we've known about this problem for years and years and years. Uh, we know what the Russian government is doing um, in terms of uh, kicking out uh, Western companies. Um, to be able to close the space of free speech in Russia, which is now de facto closed, more or less. Um, there's, YouTube is still there somehow, uh, but probably not for that much longer. But we don't have a path forward on these really critical issues around data sharing and cloud, around what do we do about disinformation? What do we do to help uh, keep spaces of free speech open authoritarian regimes? All of that has to do with platform regulation and technology issues. 
Um, and I think there, these are the places where I think we're going to have a really difficult time, um, you know, not just aligning on values, but actually doing something about it. I mean, I think uh, to, your, to your point, I think uh, Europe definitely does not know what it means by digital sovereignty. I think it depends which, which country you're in, to, uh, frankly. Um, Tarun and Alejandro, I think Alina's point is really spot on. And, and in typical journalist fashion, I'm just going to steal her, her perspective, you know, if you don't mind. Because um, you look at the statement is about democratic values. And, you know, uh, there's no doubt that the US and the EU align in so many ways, right? It, it's not, this is not, you know, two distinct um, uh, governmental regimes. But then I also look at uh, everything from data protection rules to um, the recent Digital Markets Act in Europe with its uh, antitrust overhaul, the Digital Service Act, both focusing on e-commerce and social media responsibilities. I look at the harmful risks put into the AI Act, uh, the, uh, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, frankly, this continues. How much can the EU and US overlook those separate regulatory regimes to focus on the underlying principles when in the end, if you're going to look at Russian disinformation, you're going to end up dealing with platform governance and rules. If you're looking maybe at certain um, industries, you're going to run into competition issues. How much can you sidestep the actual regulation of this to focus on principles? Uh, I think let's go for Taron first, because I, I uh, gave it to Alejandro the, the last time. Well, I'll leave it to Alejandro to talk about your digital sovereignty question, but I, I, th I think what I'd say is, you know, we we can and we're not going to ignore any of this. I think the, you know, I think we've, as you all know, kind of the DSA and the DMA move forward. And so I think now the question is, how will they be implemented? Uh, I think that's where U.S. companies are focused right now. Um, and that's hopefully where productively we can have have a have a good discussion uh, uh, going forward. Um, and whether that is kind of formally in the TTC or informally in the TTC, none of nothing nothing is getting um, you know shoved under the rug here. So um, you know I think our position generally has been quite clear on these issues, right? I don't think uh, obviously we don't want to see any sort of discriminatory uh, activity against U.S. companies. Um, but 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 at the same time, as you all know, um, uh, you know, if, if you look at what President Biden has said about regulation uh, when it comes to large large technology platforms, uh, when you look at some of the appointments that he has made um, across the administration, um, I think regulation um, along the lines um, that we have discussed is something that 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 he takes seriously, the administration takes seriously as well. So. I think there is uh, there is there is some opportunity here for alignment that might not have existed right um, uh, a little while ago, um, and that's something that we often uh, uh, talk about. And it's not just in the executive branch; it's also in the Congress, as you know, uh, if you're tracking kind of some of the legislation uh, there. So there, I think there are some opportunities there. But look, uh, you know, I think just the, the question about information manipulation, and you know, we're particularly focused on the foreign information manipulation element of this and Russia was particularly highlighted, but they're not the only actors doing this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, we will not be doing exactly the same thing. We will not, we, our systems are, are just different. We, you know, as, as, as everyone knows, our First Amendment, right, does not, um, would not allow certain kinds of um, uh, uh, prohibitions that may be uh, available uh, in other contexts, including uh, in Europe, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be having a really robust dialogue about the threats that we're seeing, the discussions that we're having with the platforms, the ways that we can uh, insist on more transparency, um, uh, ways uh, that where we do align, we're, we're taking common approaches um, in terms of enforcement and so on. Uh, there's still a huge landscape for opportunity there. And so that's really what this, I think, boils down to. After two and a half years, I should know how to demute de myself. Um, when it comes to turn, just to come back to you on that point, how do you get over those issues, right? Because I understand focusing on where there is a like-minded view on many things, data governance, AI, et cetera. But at some point, one side is going to be passing rules and 
just depending what happens with Congress post the November midterms, it might get even more difficult to pass rules. So how much can the TTC move forward on setting sort of a voluntary set of principles which inevitably need to be based in either regulation or enforcement, either from the DOJ, FTC, or someone else. Thanks, Mark. I you kind of bring up a kind of your kind of question about elections and so on. And look, I I think there's an opportunity here to build um, um, a, a foundation of bipartisan support in the United States for the work that we're doing through the TTC. Um, you know, so Lena pointed out earlier a lot of our concerns in the technology area trade issues um, are driven in the United States by, um, uh, by what China is doing in many cases. Um, and as, 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 you, as you know, um, uh, a lot of those concerns are shared on a pretty broad bipartisan basis. In part, that's why um, you know, the, you know, the Bipartisan Innovation Act or the Senate version of it, at least that I referenced earlier, you know, it passed the Senate by 68 to 32. Um, and if you, if you take those concerns seriously, you know, transatlantic alignment is really a crucial part of your strategy here. So I see opportunities there. And then if you look again at the question about um, uh, uh, regulation uh, uh, along the lines that we, we were talking about, again, there's some, there's bipartisan support for, for a number of pieces of legislation as well. So I guess I, I see opportunity for a little bit more continuity here than, than some may um, and to build some bipartisan support. Um, uh, you know, getting actual legislation is very hard. Obviously, um, uh, we're in the middle of a conference, you know, on the Innovation Act, which we, we haven't had conference in a very long time. There are generations of staffers who just haven't seen a conference before. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that's a really good sign. Um, uh, and and the, that those kinds of negotiations are underway. And at least when I have the opportunity to, to talk about what we're doing in TTC with, with colleagues uh, on the Hill, on a bipartisan basis, I, I think there's a real opportunity for support and um, uh, keeping this uh, moving forward. Alina, I think you had a, a comment. Yeah, just, just a quick comment. I'm sorry to keep going back to like the national security side of this, but I think every time I go to Europe and I, I talk to European colleagues, um, especially I think in, look, I just came from Poland and Estonia. So this is where uh, my current frame of mind is coming from. I was really surprised how in that part of the world, of course, because they're the frontline state uh, for Russian aggression, but for so many other reasons, there's a really different perspective emerging, um, I think, um, in terms of where, where you know, policymakers, uh, individuals from that part of the world really see the real threats. I mean, and, you know, it's interesting that in the, generally speaking, it's a bit of a blanket statement, but what I have found um, over the last several months is that there's been a hardening of countries that have a, you could say, a more assertive stance towards Russia because they're very close to Russia and they have some serious con concerns on their security, but they also have a much more assertive stance towards China. Um, and, you know, when we look at some of the other legislative efforts that are happening from Brussels and the DMA, I think, being the prominent example of that, you know, I do have some concerns that Chinese companies are not in scope, you know, because we're not thinking about uh, things like competition policy from a national security lens. The TTC is, is again, the bright spot here because I think it tries to do that exact thing. But I wonder if there's, you know, trains going in opposite directions um, here. Um, and that in fact, it's also kind of driving some of the divisions that have been emerging in Europe on different issues around, you know, security more broadly. Uh, because what I've heard from you know, I, you know, I won't reveal anyone's names, but I heard from some of these meetings I had in Estonia and Poland is really deep concerns about digital security um, and how that is being considered or, or not considered um, in the context not of the TTC, but uh, some of the other legislative efforts that are happening um, in the EU, the DMA, I think, being the, the dominant one I heard people talk about then. So I just wonder if, you know, we're just kind of on separate trajectories here that and you know, there's some fantastic work happening in the TTC, but is it not going against some of the other efforts? So that's more of a comment, but I do wonder if there could be an opportunity in the future to start thinking about um, that we haven't done, frankly, how other legislative uh, proposals and these are domestic issues on competition policy um, could be discussed in the TTC context, you know, without you know, specific deliverables perhaps, uh, and maybe this is already happening, uh, but if we don't see that um, outside, um, maybe uh, the working groups that's happening in private, it's not being really discussed in public. 
Alejandro, I'm just like putting Tyrone on the spot for to, to be a representative for, for Washington. I'm, I'm loath to make you a representative for Brussels, but you know, any response to Alina's point? I, I believe there is a separate competition dialogue with actual regulators, the FTC, DOJ, and DG Comp. But in terms of both the DMA and how that fits into sort of the cooperation within the TTC, uh, do you have a comment? Thanks, Marcus. Uh, I do, but first of all, let me come back and if I may correct this notion that uh, somehow uh, the regulatory agenda uh, in, in Brussels is only uh, focused in one direction. I mean, if, actually, if you, if you take a bigger picture of everything we're doing, uh, you will see a, a lot of consistency here because the, the, the issue is, is that uh, we don't regulate only against uh, certain companies. We regulate on the basis of horizontal behaviors. Uh, if you look at the DMA, uh, this is really uh, about uh, making sure that those that have immense power in the market um, cannot abuse it. Um, uh, and that, by the way, we don't know yet who's going to be part of it or not, who's going to be designated a gatekeeper. Now, that's going to take about a year. Um, if you look at the rest of our agenda, uh, we look at things uh, that are very focused on non-market economies and how they behave. And we are also very focused on data security and digital security. So you will see that um, actually shortly before going to Paris, I spent uh, until 1.30 uh, a.m. on a trial on the Network and Information Systems Directive. We are, we've just agreed legislation that not only raises the resilience of uh, the cyber resilience of the union as a whole, but one of the things we do is that we've now basically made the 5G security toolbox, the process that led up to that, uh, it's now in the statute for any kind of ICT supply chain security issue. So we will now be able to, to do the, the same thing we did for 5G to look at different parts uh, of the supply chain. And this is an, a very important instrument from a digital security perspective. Um, if you look at what we're doing on foreign subsidies, uh, we're about to pass uh, legislation to make sure that uh, companies that are receiving um, su intransparent subsidies from non-market economies, that, they, <clears throat> that we can block them from acquiring companies in Europe or that we can uh, take measures to remedy anti-competitive behavior in Europe. We are about to uh, pass uh, the international procurement instrument that will make sure that those who do not open reciprocally the procurement markets to us, uh, uh, we can take measures uh, against them. Uh, we are about to pass uh, an anti-coercion instrument uh, to make sure that those that use economic coercion against us, we can take measures against them. So I think you need to look at really the bigger picture here uh, to get a sense of uh, what you call national security implications in the regulatory agenda. Uh, rather than just focus on a number of few uh, uh, initiatives. And coming back to your question, Mark, on uh, what is in the agenda of, of and how this deals, uh, how we deal with this in the agenda of the TTC, I think what, what Tarun said is, is correct. Some of this, uh, nothing gets dropped except under the rug. Some of this is formal, some, some of it is informal. Um, in terms of the TTC, we know that uh, some of the measure of success would be concrete in terms of projects that, that, that we're working on. Some of, the, some of it will be intangible in terms of the uh, uh, irritants that we would have otherwise not avoided um, uh, uh, because the, of the conversations we have and the trust we create. So everything is discussed. There are limits to it though. We as executive, and it's the same I understand on the US side, we cannot take commitments on behalf of our co-legislators. We cannot take commitments on behalf of the European Parliament and we have the Council who are working on legislation. So, of course, we can uh, discuss the rationale for our proposals. Uh, we can discuss how they will be implemented, um, but we cannot, we, we cannot control our, our legislators. That's not our role. Uh, so, from that perspective, we also need to learn the lessons from TTIP. Um, this is not a trade agreement. This is not about immersing ourselves into each other's regulatory systems. That would be a, a, a mistake. Uh, there would be no, we don't really have the democratic legitimacy for that. Uh, what we, however, can do, and I think uh, AI is a very good example, is that while respecting our regulatory autonomy and that we have different systems, we can really seek convergence that can make a difference on the ground. So first of all, you do that by aligning on principles. So at, at let's say, a higher level than legislation, um, so in the case of AI, we have agreed that we both support a, a risk-based approach to, uh, to AI, risk, to, to AI <coughs> excuse me, 
to making sure that AI is trustworthy. Um, and we each will have our different tools for that. Uh, so on the EU side, we, we will have the AI Act. I, I know that on the US side, they're working on, on an AI Bill of Rights that I suspect will look uh, quite uh, similar to what we're doing. Um, and I know that the agencies already have in the statute the ability to take some of the measures that we are now proposing in the AI Act. Uh, so our systems will be different, but if the principles are converging, are agreed, go in the same direction, then when it comes to implementing this either legislation or, or, or regulations or even voluntary measures, what it matters is that companies have the same implementation tools. And this is what Tarun was talking about, that we've agreed a joint roadmap to create such set of tools so that companies, especially SMEs on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, can use the same tools to comply with requirements from both sides. And that would make a huge uh, difference for them one day when it has when when they have to comply uh, on both sides. So I, I'm actually optimistic in terms of the convergence that we are seeking formally or informally through the TTC and that that we are achieving, uh, and that uh, I think the TTC in itself can 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 help us get there. Thanks for that. I, I think we have one round of questions left, and I'm going to really massacre a metaphor here, so forgive me. Uh, I I kind of see. The first meeting of the TTC back last September in, in Pittsburgh is sort of episode four of Star Wars, sort of the, you know, uh, where, and, and this time was, forgive me, sort of the, you know, uh, episode five, uh, The Empire Strikes Back in terms of sort of getting things going. And it'll only take sort of the meeting in December, we'll have the return of the Jedi in terms of actual implementation and things coming to the fore. Again, forgive me, I, I kind of wanted to use the metaphor, I, I'm not sure it worked that well, but maybe can I ask the three of you, Maybe to Tyrone first, um, when it comes to the meeting in December, you know, and, and what would you hope to be some sp specific outputs and outcomes from, from the meeting over the next six months? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I, I look, I think that's a fair, uh, a fair kind of characterization. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, what I, what I hope we see is a number of discrete projects that really um, kind of are a manifestation of the policies now that I think we've been able to converge on uh, at the most recent TTC uh, discussion. And you know, I think you know when we when we talk about a task force when it comes to digital infrastructure. So hopefully, what could emerge from that are okay. What are some clear areas of focus there? You know, what what kind of what kind of infrastructure and what countries are we talking about? Could we see some kind of could we see some common effort in certain places? Um, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to export controls, um, I think all of us are keenly aware of the challenges of our current architecture um, that uh, has Russia participating in it and the ability of those to continue to get business done. And so I think what what oh, what, what what could um, a new and emergent architecture look like? So I think we could be a little bit more concrete um, uh, in that space as well. Um, I think uh, on the standardization front, I think we were really glad to have agreement on the strategic standardization information uh, mechanism, you know, that one, just to be very honest, it, it's going to be hard to show um, exactly what, um, you know, the, the kind of concrete results, because what's really going on is there's just now a regular dialogue, right? But I think we might be able to kind of point to where that dialogue um, is resulting um, in coordinated efforts um, uh, in some places uh, that could even extend to ways that we talk about um, appointments and, and, and leadership um, in some standards bodies as well. Um, and then I think uh, you know we've we've we've, we've on on the on the AI front. Uh, obviously, we we've committed to developing a roadmap. So hopefully, we'll have something to show uh, uh, for that, um, and also be able to explain then how that could relate to the implementation of principles or even uh, regulation uh, down the line. Um, so those are just you know a few a few areas. We have no idea what geopolitics is going to throw our way in the meantime. Uh, but as you pointed out, you know, as Lena pointed out, um, if the TTC weren't responsive to crises either, um, uh, then it really wouldn't be um, uh, demonstrating its value. Um, so uh, I think I think we have a good sense of kind of an agenda going forward. But I, I'm I'm confident other things uh, will be thrown our way too. Please, no more wars. That's all I'm asking for. Um, Alejandro, uh, Alejandro. 
what, what would you like to see come from the December meeting? Um, I agree with both of you. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, Tarun has already mentioned some of the, the, the key areas we'll be working hard to, to achieve results for. Um, I think what he said at the beginning is very important that um, now that we've moved from agenda to policy that we start delivering projects, uh, this is something that will be top of mind for us. Uh, because that's what really makes then a difference on the ground that people, companies, researchers, that they can see and feel with, with, with a big TTC brand on, on them. I think that this is really uh, what, what we need to, to, to work on right now. Um, so he already mentioned a few of them. Uh, I think um, we discussed the, the development of finance. Hopefully this is something that by the time we next meet, we already have identified at least one project or more. Um, it's easy to there are a lot of uh, ducks to get. On, uh, on a line for something like that, but I think uh, it's, it's possible. Um, we will see, uh, I think, on the uh, generally on the research and innovation side, uh, I hope this is an area that in the next few months we can give it a boost um, because uh, maybe it was a little bit too understated at the beginning, but uh, it, it goes without saying that uh, uh, if, if, if we can go do things together, we're more likely uh, to get there uh, faster than uh, if we do them separately. So, um, I hope we'll be able to line up some 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 projects uh, or call for proposals or something like that by the next meeting. But uh, I, I don't want to say too much because I know Mark that you you will you will hold me to it uh, in a few months time. I, I wish I had that power, Alejandro. Um, Alina, I'm going to give you the last and frankly, unfortunately, very brief uh, comment in terms of from the outside. What would you like to see happen? Uh, well, I, 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 yes, thank you for that. I, I could have a long laundry, laundry list of things um, because I do think the TTC is a fantastic platform uh, for not just aligning on values, but also mapping out a way forward. But I'll just mention two things. One is, um, Tarun already mentioned export controls. I mean, this has become such a critical issue um, with Russia as well, not just China, obviously. I would like to see more of a developed roadmap in the short, medium and long term as to what that's going to look like. Um, and second, the supply chain resilience. I mean, yes, it's it's nice to say we want our supply chains to be resilient, but what does that actually mean in practice? Um, that's a really long-term strategic vision that we need to have for that because it's, these things are not straightforward. They're incredibly complex to do. And uh, certainly we're experiencing what dependency means right now in, in all kinds of different ways um, in our ability to innovate in technology. And, and lastly, you know, this is this might be outside out of the scope of the TTC, but investment screening. You know, we've been dancing around this issue um, for a very long time, uh, but I think Europe really needs to be thinking also about how, how to do more um, strict investment screening when it comes to especially investment in infrastructure at a European level. There's been a lot of great movement in that direction, but I think there's a lot more that can be done there, especially when it comes to, come to digital infrastructure issues, which has touched on a lot of the things we've been talking about in this conversation. So thanks so much, Mark. Thanks, Alina. And I have to say thanks to Tarun and Alejandro and everyone who joined us uh, on here. I'm going to say a blatant last plug. My name is Mark Scott. I'm a uh, political chief tech correspondent. I write a weekly newsletter specifically about digital trade and tech issues called Digital Bridge. Please sign up. Uh, and with that, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. And thanks for everyone for watching along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.